My name is Tim Rice. Uh, I'm Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the School of the Arts and Architecture at UCLA. I'm a professor in the Ethnomusicology Department here. We have the only Department of Ethnomusicology in the country, and we're probably the largest ethnomusicology program in the world, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. My special area is um, where I do my research is I do research in Bulgaria in particular, in Macedonia. These are countries where they speak a Slavic language, somewhat like Russian. And uh, years ago when I was in college, um, I fell in love with this music quite by accident. I saw a sign on a wall saying, international folk dancing, no partners needed. And I didn't have a partner. So uh, I went there and it turned out they were doing line dancing, uh, dancing and not partner dancing, but line dancing. And um, it was fun physically. I was an athlete at that point. I was also a musician, so the athletic part of the dance was appealing. And then musically, the music was pretty interesting. They were doing all these additive meters. So they were doing all this music in like, what I came later to learn was like 5-8 time, 7-8 time, 9-8 time, which I'd never actually even heard before. But, I, but it was kind of intriguing to me musically. And actually, um, the first questions I ever asked about music had to do with these meters, because I was, I was dancing, and all the dancing seemed really natural to me. And um, I, I remember going over to the record, you know, where they used to play all the records that we were dancing to, and on the record jacket notes it would say, this dance is in 7-8 time. And I would ask my colleagues there, 7-8 well, time? What, what does that mean? And they'd say, oh, we don't know. And so, so that was the first question I ever asked about music, actually. I never asked any, I played Mozart, clarinet, concertos, and various things. I never asked any questions about that stuff. So I actually asked, finally, my own question about music. And in some ways, that set me on the path toward a kind of academic life. And eventually, I figured out what 7-8 time was. I remember the first time I ever saw 7-8 time, in a, in a, I went to the library to see if I could find any of this music from the Balkans, uh, southeastern Europe, and found a book on Greek music, and sure enough, they had something in 7-8, and I looked at it, and I counted it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I could not figure out how to turn that thing around in seven beats, so I put it back on the shelf. Eventually, I figured it out, and I was kind of on my way. Well, as I said, I came to be in love with Bulgarian music actually through dancing. I went to dances where they were teaching these kind of Balkan line dances. I became fascinated with the physicality of the dances. I became fascinated with the asymmetrical meters in the dances. And then I was listening to the music. I was noticing that half the recordings or more were being played on clarinet, a clarinet lead. And I play clarinet, so I thought, well, maybe I could play this stuff. So uh, I got some, I asked people who were dancers, I said, does anybody play any musical instruments here? And somebody said, yeah, I play guitar. Somebody said, I play accordion even. And so we formed a little band and we, we took the music off of the records. We, we transcribed it off of the records. I didn't know what to call that process at that point, but we, we wrote the music down and we began to play it for our fellow dancers so they could dance to our music instead of to records. So I was really heavily involved in that and that was my, that was the most fun I was having when I was in college. Uh, because I wasn't a music major at that point. Um, and then about a month before I graduated, someone told me that in a nearby university in the next academic year, this is one month before I graduated from college, at the nearby university they were going to have a, a Greek fellow come there. He was going to teach people to play Greek clarinet. He was going to teach them to speak Greek and he was going to lead them on a field trip the following summer to Greece. So I went up to this university. It was Wesleyan University in Connecticut. and. Um, they talked to me about that program. They showed me uh, a room with a, a Javanese gamelan in it, this big gong orchestra. They showed me a room with a huge pile of Afri West African drums. And I said, what is this? And they said, it's ethnomusicology. And I said, well, I don't know what that is, but that's what I want to do. And uh, at that point, I, had n I, I really was up, totally up in the air about what I'd do with my life. And uh, I certainly didn't think I would become a professional musician. Uh, but um, when they told me I could study this music and, and maybe get played, get paid rather for, um, for not playing, for, uh, for studying uh, music and writing about it, I thought, this is for me, this is what I want to do. Well, ethnomusicology is the academic study of music from all over the world. And the fundamental, probably intellectual questions that ethnomusicologists today are asking about music is what is its uh, meaning in culture, What's its meaning in society? How is it used politically? How do musicians support themselves economically? So ethnomusicology is a kind of a very awkward and odd name for 
what we might better call the anthropology of music, in effect. So we travel, ethnomusicologists travel all over the world, and they travel all throughout the United States uh, looking for music that, that people are making without asking the question, is this good music or not good music? If people are making it, then ethnomusicologists are interested in it. And, um, and then we study the, the systems, um, the, the musical systems, the musical structures, the musical theory, if you will, of the various cultures that we encounter. Uh, one typical technique that ethnomusicologists routinely use is we take lessons with musicians in the culture to acquire what we call bimusicality. Actually, a professor here at UCLA named Mantle Hood, who founded the program here, invented that term. He assumed that every ethnomusicologist would be musical in their own culture. And then they go to, a, to study in another culture and they become bimusical by acquiring musicality in that culture and by interacting with musicians and really attending to the details of music and music making, they would learn something really, really important about the music that they could then write about in their scholarly work. So even though it's the anthropology of music, there's a strong emphasis on, um, in the field on uh, really learning how to play the music and really understanding at a very deep level. In the music that I study, storytelling, unlike in Africa, is not a very important part, I would say. Africa has this wonderful tradition of storytelling and songs that go along with the stories. So they tell the stories like children's, uh, t just children's stories, and in the middle there'll always be a song. And then all the children can participate in the song and they can even get up and dance. And that's a wonderful part of that tradition. And they teach ethics and they teach you know, how to be a good human being through those stories. In Bulgaria, the stories, actually are contained in the songs. So they don't, they don't have a separate tradition of telling the stories. Each song is typically a story. And the stories, interestingly enough, in this particular culture, the stories are almost always from a woman's point of view. They're almost, the best singers in the culture are women. And when you think, uh, when, when you think carefully about the songs, they're really, t they're telling the stories of women's lives because women sing songs on every occasion. They sing songs while they're cooking their food. They sing songs while they're sewing their clothes traditionally. Uh, women are always singing songs because they didn't have hands. They were always doing something with their hands, right? Uh, they never had time to go off and practice their instruments. So men played musical instruments. Women pl uh, were, were singers and they tell these wonderful stories. And when I would talk to the women, they would say, this, this really happened no matter how uh, odd the story might be or something, they, they, they use the songs to record the stories of their life and their life experience. The main, um, the main traditional role of costuming was, um, again, uh, for women, uh, women's costumes were quite ornate and showed two things. One is the richness of the embroidery showed just how well trained they were, that they were good sewers and so on, and they could therefore sew the clothes that their families needed and so on. But they also wore jewelry. And this jewelry would often be gold coins made into necklaces, which would hang around their necks. And then when they danced, these gold coins would uh, jingle and really provide a kind of rhythmic accompaniment to, uh, to, their, uh, to their dancing. So it became part of the rhythm of the of the music. And very often the music was provided by a single instrumentalist playing a melody, so there wasn't actually a drummer present. And so these jingling bells or these jingling uh, gold necklaces would, uh, would be part of, would become part of the music. Well, there are different ways to do that, but I'll tell you about one interesting thing I, I think is interesting that I, I used to do. Um, I used to talk about the fact that uh, in the music well, I, I used to teach a course called uh, The History of Music, actually. I taught the first semester of a four-semester sequence in The History of Music, standard stuff in all curricula in, in, um, around the United States in music. And in my first semester, I, would, I, I said, we, we need to ask the question, the history of what music, actually? And I'm going to answer that question for you today by saying, uh, I think the history of music should be the history of the music of our time and place. So where we need to start before we launch into the history of music is we need to talk about what is the music of our time and place like. And so in that class I'd talk about contemporary avant-garde twelve-tone music and minimalism and I'd talk about popular music and jazz and uh, ethnic music and immigrant music, all kinds of music that kids could listen to if they just walked outside the doors of the, uh, the university. And, uh, and after we did that for six weeks or so, uh, I said, now what does the history of this music look like? 
it doesn't exactly look like the history of Western classical music, does it? Part of it is the history of Western classical music, but you can see that the history of the music in our time and place, to understand that we've got to go to Africa, and we've got to go to China, and we've got to go to the Middle East, and we've got to go to Latin America. And so one way to introduce what's sometimes called world music is to make the kids understand that actually world music is here with us today. It's present in our lives today, and it's present in the lives of the leading musicians making music today. So that's one way I introduce it, not as something uh, that's exotic and far away, but something that's very close, and where musicians today really are working with this material, uh, and where, unfortunately, academics very often are, for some reason, trying to keep that material out. But most musicians are ignoring the academics, and they're actually working with that material. So providing them, in some ways, with the building blocks of their, for their own creativity is one way I approach introducing uh, world music to, to people. We're studying, uh, really st studying the music of today, unlike a historical musicologist who can go and pull a volume of Mozart off the shelf and look at a score. Uh, our scores are, um, are the, living, uh, the living music of today, which if it's preserved at all is typically pr preserved in recording. So the history that we can do in ethnomusicology is typically about 100 years deep. It's the history of recording. And so sometimes we work on that. It's very interesting for us to follow developments in, uh, so let's say, in, in African music, for example. We can go back to the 30s, for example, and start hearing what, what did African popular music sound like in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, and then what caused those changes. That can be very interesting. But we're also usually out in the field with people making music today, struggling with questions like, uh, who am I? Uh, what, what does it mean to be a Ghanaian today? Am I a, am I Am I part of the modern world, or am I not part of the modern world? Uh, how, do I, how do I understand who I am? And many people today who have lots of choices, I mean, uh, you know, they have choices about who they are. Um, you know, they can, they, can they can grow up and live a traditional life, or they can move into the city. Maybe from the city, they can actually move to L.A. And as they make those moves, they're very often using music to help them understand who they are, and also to help present who they are to uh, other people. So if you ask me, you know, uh, if we meet an African here in, uh, in Los Angeles, for example, uh, it may be that he's an African who's playing on an African drum while rapping and using reggae rhythms in the background. And he's trying to say something uh, to us about, about who he is and how he understands himself in this modern world while employing some traditional elements, some modern elements. Here at UCLA, for example, uh, we offer 12 different ensembles as part of our instruction, 12 different what we call world music ensembles. So again, as part of their study, we expect them to learn, not just learn about a given kind of music, but actually learn physically how to play it and, and so on. So we offer courses in uh, Arab music, in mariachi music, in uh, African-American gospel music, in Ghanaian music, in Bulgarian music, in Chinese music, Korean music. We offer all these things. Students usually don't take all those things, but they take a few things. And, uh, and they can really, uh, really widen the scope of their, of their understanding of, of music. I just had uh, talked to a student just yesterday who was saying she's in two ensembles this year. It's her first year here. And she said, it's really changing the way I understand music and the way I view music. Years ago, I remember um, I taught a course uh, on the history of music. So I taught all the history, all the students in the music school uh, at, at another place that I taught. I taught them all in their first year. And I went back there 10 years after I'd left, and I met a bunch of people who were in the field of music education. So they were out in the schools teaching, and they told me, and I didn't know this, they told me that the exposure they had gotten to world music, ethnic music, if you will, from all over the world, had really changed their understanding of music and really helped them in their music education, which uh, had been based primarily on band, orchestra, and chorus, and this, this sort of thing. And this is very important because today, Music, education, music educators are going out into a world where band, orchestra, and chorus are not necessarily taken for granted things that parents are telling their kids to be involved in. Unlike, say, in my case, where you know, that was one of the interesting things you could do in school. But now, I mean, why would a kid immigrant from Jamaica decide he wants to be in a, cho in a chorus or a band? You know, maybe in a steel band, maybe. Or maybe if you could do some calypso or something like that, that might make some sense. But band, orchestra, and chorus? I don't know. 
when we teach ethnomusicology, when we start uh, with the music, we almost immediately go out into all many other aspects of culture, sometimes to the food, sometimes to Oh, belief systems, religion can be quite important because almost every religion has music as a part of it. Um, music is all, often a place where basic ethical values are expressed. It can be, it's a kind of book in, in, a, in an oral culture, it's a kind of book. Um, very often uh, music, music performance is often based on fundamental rules, if you will, about social relationships. So for example, in our culture, we sort of have a culture based quite a bit on leadership and followership. So when we, um, when we have conversations, we allow one person to speak for a while. And then we all listen, and then that person stops, and then maybe we, we start again. And, and those, that's a fundamental way we relate to one another socially. So there's a kind of the, the shape of our music making. So when we do music, what do we do? We have soloists, right? And, every, and we have uh, concerts where everybody's quiet while the soloist speaks or while the band speaks or whatever it is. Well that mimics fundamental uh, aspects of our social relationships. In other cultures it's different. For example, in some cultures people when they speak to each other they speak simultaneously. They, they, they're just always constantly talking. They don't wait. They don't give any space to an individual speaker. Well it turns out when they make their music they make it the same way. So we are often showing those, uh, those kinds of connections uh, between music and culture and that's very important. Uh, in ethnomusicology. When we think about the importance of music, I think that um, what we do find is that all cultures have music. Uh, interestingly, they don't all value it in the same kind of way. Um, in some fundamentalist Islamic societies, for example, um, they regard music as the, the work of the devil. And so it is, it's problematic. Uh, um, in fact, I had a, a case in a uh, uh, that I knew up in uh, Toronto, Canada, where there were a lot of immigrants from Iran, in fact, fundamentalist uh, Muslims, and I spoke to a music educator up there. In our culture, we have the idea that music is good. So we say things are music to my ears. That, that says something about our attitude toward music. So we naturally think that, of course, every child should have a mu some music education, some exposure to music. Well, he had the parents of these children in the school coming to him and saying, I'm sorry, but my, my child can't participate in music because it's the work of the devil. So I think that ethnomusicologists are typically more impressed by differences between and among cultures than they are by commonalities. I think most lay people are probably more interested in figuring out what the commonalities are. So we speak about music as a universal language, for example, and, uh, and, and we like those kind of things. My, my sense of, one of my theories about music and what it does in almost all cultures, is it's used to speak and communicate across various boundaries that the society sets up for itself. So music is used, for example, in religion to communicate between the human world and the supernatural world. It crosses that boundary. Uh, in, a, in, a, in some cultures where men and women are kept separate, music is used by men to speak to women when they can't actually have contact with them. They sing across that boundary. Uh, young people sing to let older people know what they're thinking, thinking at that particular time. So that, that's one kind of commonality, but actually ethnomusicologists don't spend a lot of time uh, talking about those sorts of things. They're rather more impressed in talking about all the different cultural particulars that, that they encounter and all the interesting different sorts of things they find. Well, I think, I think probably the most, um, one of the more interesting things that happens when you are an ethnomusicologist and you, you, you begin, you learn, you learn these other cultures, uh, music, another culture's music, and you, you learn it to the level of actually being able to play along with musicians in that culture. Um, what happens is you are accepted by them in a way that I think is very difficult when the only way you have of communicating with them is either talking to them or in even primitive mode like as a tourist just saying you know cheers or bottoms up or you know whatever you do in a bar when you're traveling in a culture where you don't understand the language. What happens is when you learn to play music with other people they they come to almost like trust you uh, they tr because they have to trust your they trust your musicianship right if you're there uh, playing the, I, I, I had, at one point I got, uh, in Bulgaria, I, um, I became the drummer for a group that was playing for dancers. 
Well, they had to trust, the dancers and the musicians had to trust that I'd keep the beat for the entire duration of the dance correctly, right? And so that level of trust um, and, and acceptance that you get from, from being able to play with musicians is really quite extraordinary. And uh, so that, uh, that, that sort of thing is something that is kind of irreplaceable and very different from just straightforward uh, speech communication. In fact, I had uh, in one time in Bulgaria, I was I was at a dance, I was at just at a like a fair, you know, where people were dancing, and I was standing around talking to somebody, and then I'd get in the dance, and I'd dance, and then uh, I'd I'd talk, and then I'd dance, and there was this guy looking at me, and this was during the communist period when there was great tension between the United States and this communist country, which Bulgaria, where I was working, was, and this guy was really giving me the hairy eyeball, looking me over, and I thought, oh boy because I'd had a few run-ins with the equivalent of their FBI, you know. And um, I thought, this must be some FBI guy, you know, looking at me, and Bulgarian FBI. And uh, finally, he waves me over, and I thought, oh, he's, gonna, he's really going to get on my case. He's going to kick me out of the village, whatever. And he said, so who are you? And I said, well, I'm a student. I'm an American student, and I'm here in Bulgaria studying Bulgarian music. And he said, you lie. <laughs> and then I said, and then he said, you speak Bulgarian and you dance Bulgarian dances, therefore you are a Bulgarian. And that level of acceptance really around artistic, the making of art, in this case dancing, or in other cases the making of music, is really something very, very special. Where you, they have this expression in Bulgarian where they say you're our, you're one of us in effect, and they, through music you become one of them. It must have been very touching. Yeah. When I was doing my work with Bulgarian singers, for example, I assumed that if I asked them a question like, where does music come from? Well, in some cultures, they'll tell you, well, the music comes from the frogs. Our ancestors learned them from the frogs who they heard singing in the forest and this sort of thing. In Bulgaria, I knew I wasn't going to get that story. I thought I was going to get a story more like Fiddler on the Roof, you know, tradition. It was just going to be, it's traditional. We've always done it this way. And I, but I was wonderfully pleased when the, the woman that I was speaking to, when I asked her, so where do these songs come from? She said, some sharp-witted woman made them up. And that was a lovely answer and gave me a lot of insight into how to understand the song texts and what the song texts were about. But I'm not sure I can report on something particularly exotic. The instruments that Bulgarians use, they, they basically have a fairly small set of instruments that have become standard. One of the most fun uh, of them and one that I play is the bagpipe, actually. Bagpipe, most people think of bagpipes as being a Scottish instrument, but they used to be played by every culture in Europe. Every culture had a bagpipe. They mainly disappeared with industrialization. The clarinet and the accordion probably effectively came along and, and caused the bagpipe to disappear. It's an instrument made out of a goat, goat skin. They skin the goat in such a way that it can be, by tying it off, it can be made into a bag. And they stick wooden uh, 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 what are sometimes called stocks into the neck hole and the two leg holes, front leg holes, and then they put a drone pipe and a melody pipe and a blow pipe in there, and uh, they play this instrument. It's a uh, it's a keyless instrument. It has a range of a ninth, a major ninth, and um, but the interesting thing is they can, uh, while it in principle wants to be a diatonic instrument, they figured out a way through cross fingering and half holding to make it into a fully chromatic instrument, so they can play some pretty complicated music on it. There's a wooden flute, which is a delightful instrument. It has a great sound. It's not a side-blown flute like the silver flute, and it's not like a recorder with a whistle in the end. It has, it's just a tube, and you have to play it by putting it uh, at a kind of oblique angle against your mouth and then blowing across the opposite edge. It's called caval, and uh, then you play it. Again, it's a beautiful instrument. It's about a three-octave range, fully chromatic, uh, without any keys. In fact, in, you know, in most uh, wind instruments in the West, when you, when you lift up your fingers, it's a combination of whole steps and half steps. This they've made so it's all half steps. And it's, it's a fabulous sounding instrument. They have a bowed lute, which is made in the shape of a kind of a pear. And they play it uh, somewhat like this, a kind of underhanded cello technique, and has three strings. And, and that's a fun instrument because the strings can't be pressed down against the neck. They're played in midair. So the first string is played on the fingernails like this, and the other strings are just played and just stopped like this. So that's a lovely, it has a very rich sound. They have sympathetic strings, 
and it has the most amazing reverberant sound that you can imagine. Very loud acoustic instrument with a great sound. They have a long neck plucked lute, uh, somewhat like the bazooki of Greek music, which I think people have heard of or seen. Uh, and now it's actually, they've modified it and it's, uh, it's played, um, it's tuned like the t with the top four strings of a guitar. It's an eight, eight string instrument with two and four double courses. Uh, and then they have a, 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 big, a bass drum, which they play with a big stick and a little stick. And the bass drum actually comes into Bulgaria and into Western music from Turkey, actually during the Ottoman Empire. Uh, a lot of European instruments came into, into Europe from Turkey during this period. The Ottoman Empire, they came into southeastern Europe from Turkey and they conquered southeastern Europe all the way up to Vienna before they were finally uh, defeated. But their instruments became very, very popular in the West during that period. There was a period of sort of Turcophilia or whatever you want to call it. And uh, a lot of those orchestral uh, percussion instruments came in at that time, the cymbal, for example and all, all manner of shakers and other kinds of things come from that Turkish influence. And they stayed there in Bulgarian traditional music in the form of this bass drum. The tambourine is another one. Almost the full battery of Western orchestral instruments. The, the, the kettle drum. All of these instruments come to us from Turkey, actually. Kind of interesting. Bulgarian music uh, actually uh, is based on fairly narrow music of, with a fairly narrow range of about a fifth. And within that fifth, they play in uh, four different modes. They play in a major mode, a minor mode, uh, what we would call a Phrygian or E mode. And then they have something that we sometimes in ethnomusicology, in ethnomusicology call the Hijaz mode, which is this da da di da di da di da da, that kind of mode. They play in those four modes. And um, so in some sense, the, the first degree, the fourth and the fifth are fixed, and the second and the third uh, you know, can vary. So that's how uh, Bulgarians treat uh, melodic uh, modality. They also, in some regions, have a pentatonic scale, interestingly enough. I go back to Bulgaria about uh, almost every year. Here at UCLA, we actually have a Bulgarian ensemble. We have two teachers, a husband and wife team from Bulgaria, and a couple of years ago, uh, we took the ensemble of about 35 people, took, took the ensemble to Bulgaria, and they got to perform for Bulgarians in various venues, concerts, festivals, and various things. And we're going to be taking them back in, uh, in June and July of this year. Uh, so that's one uh, context that I get back there for. And then I go back every once in a while to talk to people about what's going on again today uh, in music. There are new forms of... Uh, Bulgaria was a communist country until 1989. So they had one kind of music that the communist government supported. Since 1989, they're now in a kind of uh, democracy and a kind of free economy, and new forms of popular music have arisen. And I've been trying to follow those and keep track of what's going on in their popular music in, for the last uh, 20 years or so, and so that's kind of fun. Well, in terms of uh, ethnomusicology was founded really in the United States in the 1950s. In those early years, there were a few people who, were, who could be called leaders of the field. One was Mantle Hood, who taught here at UCLA. And he was a student of various forms of Asian art music. And he really established the fantastic program we have here at UCLA with all these performance ensembles bringing all these instruments in. There was another man named Alan Merriam who taught at Indiana University. And he was an anthropologist of music, so he had a completely different approach. He worked on uh, African music and he worked on American Indian music. And he was really interested in the the social life of music. So they were really two real leaders of the field who pushed it forward. Since that time, the field has grown. There are probably something in the order of 20 or 25 graduate programs in ethnomusicology now around the United States. And there are enough people in the field that I think it would be hard to describe any, any one of them as the leader or uh, there, there, there are certain figures that are certain people who are perhaps a bit more prominent than others. but. Um, it's a very broad-based field now. It's, it's, it, we're beginning to see what I predicted would come true some years ago, which I, I used to tell students, they'd say, can you get a job in ethnomusicology? And I said, well, ethnomusicology is a growth f industry because I said there must be 3,000 colleges and universities around the country. And I said there are probably ethnomusicologists in only about 100 of them. And someday there will be an ethnomusicologist in every one of them. And so, and that's what we're, we're really beginning to see that. We're really beginning to see that uh, th these, these music departments, s small and large around the country, are finally realizing, you know, we need one of these folks. We need an ethnomusicologist here to teach popular music, to teach world music, to teach jazz, whatever they can do. And they can do a lot of these different things. So the field is really 
really beginning to grow. And um, I, I even read, there's, I heard uh, recently that libra- somebody asked a librarian once, um, or was it a musicologist, uh, one of the things musicologists do is they create scholarly editions of the great works of Western music, right? Operas and symphonies and all this stuff. And, and, and a librarian told one of these people that wanted to do one of these scholarly editions, well, we don't, we don't buy those much anymore because now we're buying books and records for the ethnomusicologists. <laughs> so when we're having an economic impact on, uh, on other fields, you know we've kind of arrived. Ethnomusicology has really come of age in the last few years in terms of publications. One of the big landmarks in our field was in the year 2000, we published something called the Garland Encyclopedia of World Music. This is a 10-volume encyclopedia dedicated to world music. It was the first one. It really is a signal that ethnomusicology has come of age. So one thing they can do is go to their local library, or at least a good university library, and look at the Garland Encyclopedia of Music. And it's very nicely organized. Uh, it's organized by regions of the world, so if they have a particular interest in African music, they can go to the Africa volume. If they have a particular interest in Indian music, they can go to the India volume. So that's a good place to start. The other thing that's beginning to happen is textbook publishers are starting to ask us to write more and more textbooks because there are more and more apparently world music courses being taught out in the world. And so there's some very, there are some very good ones. Um, there's one called, um, I think it's called Worlds of Music, published by Shermer, and it has like six or seven case studies in it. Uh, McGraw-Hill has a very good um, uh, survey book on world music cultures of the world, uh, written by a fellow named Michael Backen from Florida State University. Uh, Prentice Hall has a nice textbook. And Oxford University Press has a really interesting series where they've asked individual ethnomusicologists to write little short books, like about 100 pages long, on their particular culture. So I've written one on Bulgarian music. And they've got about 16 of these books now. So you can go to Oxford University Press and look at this series uh, on, uh, I think it's called the Global Music Series. And that's a really good, those are really good places to begin to explore something about world music and ethnomusicology. Ethnomusicology in most schools and departments of music, I think, is kind of a marginal discipline. Most schools and departments of music really have Western classical music at their center. And jazz, popular music, world music struggles on the periphery some, somewhere to try to be accepted. But one of the interesting things, I don't know what it is, about ethnomusicologists is we often get invited to take on administrative roles. And, and my theory of that is, and this is, I don't mean to be unkind, but my theory of that is that, um, first of all, we're academics, so we understand how universities work fairly well as compared to someone who's been an artist all their life and is invited in then to teach piano or something like that. They may really not understand totally how universities work. So uh, the other thing is, of course, um, as I said before, they, they pay us not to play. They pay us actually to talk. So we're usually pretty good talkers, which means we can talk to people like deans and presidents and other things and, and make our case for funding and other sorts of things. And then I think in the case of ethnomusicology, our work is really in what we call the field, which is that we're out with people all the time. We're always, we're, to, we're always trying to gain information from people, so we have to usually, we usually get along pretty well with people. And administrators are often people who kind of get along pretty well with people and can deal with uh, the people who walk through the door complaining, you know, that their studio is too cold or that Joe Blow is making too much noise over in the drum studio or whatever it is, and we can deal with those sorts of problems. So in spite of uh, our being a kind of oddly marginal discipline, we, we have, uh, many of us have been asked to take on these kind of leadership roles in our various colleges and universities, and, and I was asked to do that here at UCLA. I think at some, in some odd level it does. That's probably really unfair. I know there are wonderful administrators who are tuba players and pianists and choral conductors and that sort of thing. But um, I just think given, given the, the marginality of ethnomusicology, it's striking how many people have risen up in, uh, in the ranks of university administrators around the country. What I usually tell parents who are concerned about the sort of real world ap ac applicability of an arts education, particularly at the undergraduate level, I, I tell them that from my point of view, an undergraduate education for, for kids is really about having fun and about following their star. That, that there is a, 
what they're going to get when they study music is they're not only going to get an education in music, but if they go to a university, they're going to get an education in how to read, how to write, how to think, uh, how to be creative. And all of those things are, all of those qualities are things that are going to stand them in good stead in the future. They may not continue in music, but in whatever walk of life they go into, the liberal arts aspect of their education is really going to help them, not to mention the discipline that they bring to things like practicing music and so on. All these things that they acquire are really going to pay off in their, in their lives in the future. And so the parents, I don't think, should be so concerned about um, uh, having their kids major in something where they think there's an obvious uh, you know, payoff uh, uh, down the line. If, if their kids are smart, if they're disciplined, if they take full advantage of what a university has to offer and what a school of music has to offer, a department of music, uh, they're going to do fine, and they're going to find their way when they graduate. Well, we're very excited here at UCLA about the possibility of forming a school of music that will unite three different departments, a Department of Ethnomusicology, Department of Music, and a Department of Musicology. And I think what we're going to be doing in the next five years is creating a really interesting, dynamic new curriculum that is first of all going to provide our students with a really great education that is going to prepare them for the world in which they, into which they are going to eventually go. And I hope, and this is probably silly to hope, but I hope that it'll actually um, have an impact beyond UCLA, that people will look to UCLA, see what we're doing, and say, you know, we might be able to do that too. Because I think that, um, I think that uh, music education, university level music education around the country is really mired in tradition. It has not been thoughtful, um, and this is gr a very gross generalization, it has not been thoughtful enough, um, and it needs to be more concerned, less concerned about the pasts of its teachers and their traditions. It needs to be more concerned about the students and their futures, and it needs to really seriously reconsider what what kinds of curricular offerings uh, the, the, the students are exposed to beyond, of course, their private lessons and other you know, obvious things like that. But what could their music history courses really be like? What could their music theory courses really be like? And I think here at UCLA we're going to be looking uh, really hard at those questions over the next five years or so and trying to see if we can't invent some really interesting uh, new curricula, new models, new courses that, with any luck, might be influential. I think when we think about the new stuff going, that, we're, that we're reading about around the world, I think th these are terrific examples of, of music students and musicians being creative uh, with the, the material in their environment, creating things that will be fun for them, useful for them, that, and so on. I, I don't think we're trying so much to uh, imitate that. And, and study those instruments or, or whatever, although we might do that as ethnomusicologists. But I think what we'd like to do at UCLA is create an environment where, where people can be creative and where people are creating those kinds of instruments because they think, wouldn't it be cool if we had this instrument that nobody's thought of uh, and for whatever purpose. So I think, that's what, I think that's what music education should be about. I think really music education should be about uh, trying to figure out ways to bring out whatever creativity is in the student. And, and I think, for example, and this is one of my, I think that, for example, in music schools, probably they think that the most creative people might be the composers. Well, if that's the case, then I think every student should be taught to be a composer. Not, you know, and, and, and so that's where I'm at with the creativity, really making every student into feeling like he or she is a creator of music. You know, when we think about new genres being created, I'm always amused uh, uh, how many genres have been created since I finished my graduate work. Um, it's really quite astonishing. You know, we thought we, we covered off the genres and then, I mean, reggae didn't exist when I finished graduate school, you know. So eth ethnomusicologists in particular uh, are always keeping up with new genres uh, that are being created all over the world. And one of the, probably the most interesting things about uh, when ethnomusicologists get together at conferences and talk to one another, it's to report on the new genre that, that ju is just emerging in Tanzania or, you know, God knows where. And so uh, studying new genres is definitely something ethnomusicologists are keeping up with. We're not just uh, studying, in other words, the traditional music of the world, but really studying the contemporary, modern, popular or unpopular music uh, of the world. In fact, there was a recently a book that was published that some of our students, at least one of our students, contributed to. It was called Bad Music. And uh, it, it was sort of on, on, a, on an aesthetic of, um, 
of noise and an aesthetic of bad music, which has you know really interesting uh, kinds of social implications as well as musical implications. I think when uh, ethnomusicologists think about the relationship between music and culture, there's been a kind of shift. Uh, when we first started out and we're trying to really link up musical structures to culture and to cultural structures, we used the, the verb um, or the, the expression that music reflected culture. And we tried to show how um, the structure of a piece of music might reflect a particular social structure, for example, or might be a representation of a particular idea in culture. Uh, now we're in a different mode. We're making, trying to really make claims about the way in which music generates culture. Uh, the way it constructs culture and so on. So, so in terms of uh, the chicken and egg concept, I think we're kind of on both sides of the fence on that and haven't, I don't think, just as I don't think anybody knows which came first uh, in, that, in that domain, probably um, ethnomusicologists be, be arguing about that in the musical domain as well. Thank you very much for talking to us. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs>